Hi, everybody. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, UPS. You heard some DHL story. You heard a lot of other stories. You'll get the, the UPS story now. Uh, let's next slide. You want to oh, give me that? I'll take it. Okay. Oh. You, they're not seeing it. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Beautiful. There we go. OK, so this is who's on the stage today. Um, my name is Mark. I'm an enterprise architect uh, for, for UPS. And uh, with me is uh, Rich West and uh, Jignesh Shah. So they are um, product owners and uh, managers at UPS. They're really responsible for application teams, which uh, you know, have been onboarded onto UPS, onto uh, OpenShift. So one important thing was uh, you know, to understand is that, that U UPS has a long strategic partnership with, uh, with Red Hat. We, you know, we've been working with uh, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux for a long time, and, um, and there was this interesting synergy where uh, we had adoption in Fuse sources, uh, Fuse stack. So we had purchased Fuse for our integration problems, and when Red Hat purchased Fuse, then it, it sort of came together. And, uh, there was a, another company here talking, I think it was uh, uh, Elise Sever, Elisevier, uh, which had a, another th similar story where they you know, had understanding about Fuse Source and they were trying to use some technologies from Fuse Source to really automate the deployment of their integration software. Um, uh, at that time, it was something called Fabric 8, uh, which, was, you know, which, could, which could do things like deploy an entire uh, application. Uh, you know, CI CD stack. So when it came with, together with Red Hat, there was this like synergy uh, where OpenShift was, you know, covering some of that same functionality. So uh, we really wanted to, you know, we, we, we were, we're familiar with that stack. We've uh, visiting a lot of uh, OpenShift, uh, you know, community events and things. And we started really seeing that there was this alignment that OpenShift covered some of that same functionality we were looking for. We wanted to, you know, create the, the capabilities to accelerate the delivery of, of applications, um, kind of get the infrastructure out of the way from application teams, um, and then provide some really robust, uh, you know, runtime features like HA and load balancing and things like that, which, uh, which we knew we needed. Um, then as we, so we started using OpenShift, we, we saw that there was really more there. There's this possibility to kind of create what we think is a, a private cloud and, and provide a kind of roadmap or a, a runway that gets us onto this hybrid cloud, which aligns well with our, with our needs. Um, so one of the things was, you know, which was the first application that would, that would uh, justify that investment? And for us, it was really this, this edge platform and uh, an application called Sipe. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Rich. Thank you. So I'm going to show you a quick vid video of the application uh, Sipe, which is part of the Edge program. This is not a trailer for Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> UPS has one of the strongest data networks in the world. Today, we're creating new ways to put it to better use. An example is Edge, a suite of more than 20 initiatives in development that will work in unison to optimize operations. It leverages data to assign tasks and minimize driver and inside employee overtime for on-road, PM sort, and AM sort operations. To get an idea of how Edge works, let's visualize the PM sort. At night, our operations tackle many tasks, some simple, others complex. With data we collect throughout the day, a central computer constructs a detailed dynamic operating plan that breaks down assignments further into tasks for a variety of work groups to perform. One of those is the sort plan. In near real time, Edge analyzes and optimizes staffing resources and prioritizes next task instructions for employees unloading and sorting packages. For example, before vehicles return to the facility, Edge begins analyzing data and prioritizes which cars should be unloaded first. If others arrive with higher priority packages, it modifies the sort plan and issues updated tasks wirelessly to unloaders and the management team. Edge also takes advantage of data to develop an operating plan. 
This plan separates tasks among employees, balancing workload and minimizing overtime. It's particularly critical when reviewing package exceptions. Throughout the day, some packages are not delivered for various reasons. Edge analyzes and divides the entire amount of work among available resources. As new exceptions arrive, the workload is rebalanced and communicated to employees in real time. Through optimization, Edge minimizes overtime, balances workloads, and improves quality. It's this dynamic use of data that creates greater value in the UPS network. Data feeds everything in the world, and UPS is using it to revolutionize its operations network, driving costs lower and margins higher. Present. There we go. Yeah. There, there we go. So, uh, SIPE is one of the biggest initiatives in the EDGE program, as we just mentioned. Uh, based on the information that we gather, uh, we synthesize information from over 40 systems. Uh, we boost the speed of decision making within our operations. Uh, it also fuels our smart logistics network strategy. Because of our OpenShift platform, we must deliver it as business needs change and also improves overall customer satisfaction. The information we, we provide to our supervisors is on a uh, mobile device. With that, we can alert the supervisor as the area is needing most attention. So if more packages are in one area of the building versus the other area, they can easily, with the information we're providing uh, with this platform, is to help the supervisor make those decisions to get our package delivery through the system as quickly as possible and improve customer satisfaction. And with that, I'll turn over to, to Jignesh to talk about our DevOps transformation journey. Thank you, Rich. Uh, I think it went out of. It did. Present. There we go. Right. OK. OK. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I know this slide is a little busy slide, but with this slide, what we wanted to highlight was uh, the ecosystem that we put together, uh, which helped us reach our CI CD goals. Um, leveraging DevOps practices to minimize the, the, the turnovers that happen between development team members and operations team members to get the code from a development environment to production environment uh, with the ultimate goal of delivering the software to meet the business needs and the customer's needs. So in that process of creating that ecosystem and changing the culture, more importantly, right? a lot of other partners talked about changing the culture, which is, which is a very big thing. We realized that it was very important to have a platform that we can rely on, that we can count on, as well as it can integrate well with all the technologies and tools listed on the slide there. Um, and sure enough, OpenShift uh, with Red Hat support came through, and we were able to deliver on this product called SIPE that uh, Rich just talked about. Uh, with that, I'll turn over to Mark, um, and he can walk us through the, the learns, uh, lessons learned while bringing our OpenShift and UPS. Yeah, the, the remaining slides are basically like lessons learned. Um, one, of the, one of the main things was, uh, you know, once we decided that we were actually gonna build out OpenShift, um, there was a long vetting process. We also did a bake-off. You heard some very similar processes which were done at, at other large companies. It's the same, same kind of thing. Uh, there was an early set of vetting of the, of, uh, you know, of, the, of the solution, but once we decided to actually build it, it took only about four months with the help of Red Hat to get it in place. Um, OpenShift goes GA in, in January, and by April 14th, we deliver a production cluster, um, which the SIP application team ended up deploying on. Um, and at the same time, we had to automate it, right? So our strategy was very similar to what others are doing, which is, uh, putting it on physical infrastructure. Uh, so, you know, bare metal servers, which means we need to automate the deployments of bare metal servers, uh, which is a scripting automation like Ansible. 
Um, that, some of that skill we didn't really have in-house at the moment, so we went with Red Hat to kind of help us deliver that. So today we have three clusters. Uh, we did a very similar thing where we, we broke up our dev, our stress, and our development clusters, which are, are three distinct clusters. Um, but across those clusters, we have about 4,000 containers running. Production has 1,500-ish uh, across two data centers. Um, so we, we were able to achieve, at least from a deployment perspective, some, some very high rate of, you know, of deployment. And the next thing that you realize is that you know, it's not just about the infrastructure, and you, you heard it today, it's about building a, a, a practice, right? Because our, our, our group, you know, as an enterprise team, was really about, uh, you know, had to, had to achieve some transformation in the organization. We have the same kind of cultural issues that other large organizations deal with. We wanted to enable things in all these areas, like new architectures. We had to come up with patterns and practices around microservices. So the first of this we took on was really microservices. Um, so what is, the, what is the governance problems that you encounter with, with, uh, with deploying microservices? You can't do microservices without automation, so we have to pick a stack that's clear for, you know, for deploying our, our, our applications quickly. So we, we selected Jenkins with, um, then, had, then as soon as you start building Jenkins pipelines, the question becomes what's our testing uh, tools and, and how do we enforce policy? Uh, so we, we pieced together a stack of tools that really allowed for that. And at the same time, when necessary, plugged in with our existing tools. So a lot of custom code ended up being written for attaching to things like our change management systems. We have existing change management tooling. Or uh, business continuity systems, right? So we had to forward traces off to our existing continuity uh, BCC uh, systems. So all of that had to be solved. Um, and the, the main point is that the scope, the scope is really much larger than then you realize if you're trying to, to transform a large organization, you have to cover all of these areas. Um, our team is also responsible for training, right? So we, we develop in-house training. And from, from our perspective, we kind of identified, you know, what were our uh, targeted training groups? Like, who, who are the users of the application, of, of the platform? So one is obviously just developers who are developing new applications. So we have a, a kind of tailored training just for them, which focuses a lot on CI, CD, the nuts and bolts of the underlying platform, but then targeted training for infrastructure and infrastructure platform teams. So they, if, if I'm a team that owns an, an enterprise uh, deployment of a database, um, what, is, what does OpenShift mean to them? And it's, it's different. Um, their view of the infrastructure is different. Uh, they may not be using the same exact, uh, you know, deployment approaches that, that they'll still have a pipeline which drives their deployments, but they may not be, they may be doing Docker builds directly, not maybe S2I uh, builds, right? So we had to target training and really put that all together so that we could you know, have a good foundation for transforming the organization. Another thing that we had to do was really measure ourselves and have some kind of model for measuring ourselves. Um, this is from uh, a go-to conference in Copenhagen. Uh, there's, it's kind of an adapted uh, model, uh, maturity model, which we added some things. That the, their model does not include things like governance, which is important in large organizations, but uh, you know, and, and we adapted it and started really using that to, to uh, measure ourselves. So we asked, you know, where do we start? Uh, you know, which, which of these tracks are really, you know, that we're, we're behind on? And, and then what can we achieve in the next year, right? What are the barriers and what can we achieve in the next year? So this gives you a nice model for saying, you know, for judging yourself. Um, another thing we encountered was just size and scale. So everything we do at UPS is has, to, has to scale. And uh, one of the limitations we found was kind of on the ingress uh, router side. So as you start throwing just huge amounts of HTTP traffic at, uh, at the cluster, you find that you, you know, the, the, at least the basic setup, you know, there's kind of a basic five server or five node setup uh, that has at least two like infra nodes. Uh, that run HA proxy routers, and those, they just will not scale once you really throw large amounts of volume at them. And that means adding multiple instances of the HA proxy, proxy having, you know, assigning different ports so they can live on the same infrastructure, then having 
um, and a hardware load balancer in front that really load balances traffic across both infra nodes. Um, another thing we found was that once you set that up, if you're gonna do Docker pushes into that same infrastructure, if it's, this is your test environment, which may not be necessary for test, but um, if you're gonna do Docker pushes directly in, then the ports you open better be also opened on the HA router, on the hardware load balancer, because Docker requires ports open on both, all, all the way through. Uh, just small things we encountered that you, you don't know until you do it. Um, uh, sizing, sizing was another thing. How do we plan out the purchasing of, of hardware? Uh, we, with, again, with the help of Red Hat, we put together a kind of model, like a three-point estimation model, which says, you know, what's our best, worst case volume? Uh, come up and make sure that you include things like efficiency, right? So uh, what's your, for a given transaction per second, how much CPU and memory you're gonna need in terms of millicores and, and memory? And then, and then come up with a model where you kind of you know, build the normal distribution and say for 90% confidence, given these best and worst cases, I will need this many servers you know, to, to deal with production. And that's, that's where we eventually got to. It was, took some time, but this, was, this is a maturing process. Uh, the other thing, and we heard it already today, some other uh, um, companies were doing things like reusable code bases for Jenkins. We encountered the same thing. The, the pipelines all tend to have the same basic steps in them. Uh, log in, build, deploy, verify, promote, right? And it really is in your best interest to capture that in a shared code base uh, that you can give back to uh, application teams and give them something that is at least a, a basic setup. And for us, we, it's a little more than basic because we took all of Git flow and the entire branching strategy involved in Bitflow and really captured all of that in a pipeline. Um, we did some very clever things like for, for things like feature uh, branches. We spawn new infrastructure. We create OpenShift projects dynamically based off check-ins to feature branches, right? Things like that, which are only possible in OpenShift uh, in this infrastructure. So, you can either build your own or wait for ours because we're trying to open source ours. We're going through our, our own little legal review process to get, to get our code base out. Uh, other thing was Jenkins. So tuning Jenkins for scale, right? Uh, you can either distribute Jenkins, which we've heard a couple of application teams, uh, you know, a couple, couple uh, companies doing that where they're kind of distributing Jenkins masters, allowing app teams to spin up their own. For us, we started, for at least from the perspective of let's build out a centralized Jenkins infrastructure, which we already had, let's expand it out. Um, but it has to scale now. So how, what do we do? We use the Kubernetes plugin, uh, start creating build agents in OpenShift, allow your Jenkins masters to offload build agents into OpenShift, and then tune the Jenkins master to aggressively uh, spin up Jenkins build agents. And these settings are specific settings we encountered. That was two days of digging through the Jenkins code base before we figured that out. Uh, so the future, um, I mean, we've had some good success with OpenShift, right? Our, we've really had, we now are in a spot where application teams are coming to us. Uh, we've, we've, we've issued, you know, we've done some of the early transformation work. Um, there is this, you know, drive now from application teams around the organization that they know their future is to build, especially if they're building anything that runs on Linux, you know, their future is to come build on OpenShift. We really think OpenShift will start to consume most of the Linux workload that's in our database, in our, uh, our, our data centers. So we want to take 3.9, build out a 3.9 cluster, um, expand our workloads. So that was one thing that we really didn't do at that time because we, you know, building persistent workloads and stateful sets. From our perspective is you really need container native uh, uh, storage. Uh, for, otherwise the management just becomes out of control. We, we, we started playing with it uh, by you know, building NFS mounts and trying to manually deal with that stuff and it's just, it will not scale when, uh, you know, at, the, at the level we want to do. Um, I'm gonna take advantage of some of those metrics and monitoring features and the open service broker API that's in OpenShift. 3.9, um, and really give our developers that full stack automation. Like once we get these persistence and these basic 
things in place so we can deploy the full application, that will complete the solution for our app teams, and that's, that's our hope. That's it. Thank you.